Welcome to October's Tech of the Month, where we discuss all the latest news and reviews. After a brief hiatus, we're back with new bikes and new launches. And there is a lot to discuss because there have been a vast amount of brand new endurance bikes hitting the market in recent months, but also what could possibly be one of the most significant product recalls in cycling history. To be honest, I want to get straight into this Shimano recall because the implications are huge and there is actually quite a lot to unpack here. So, Joe, you've become a bit of an expert over the past few days because you have been knee deep in all of the context that has been coming out of Shimano. So I think a good place to start is what's actually happened? So on the 21st of September 2023, last week at the time of filming, Shimano issued a recall in the United States of America and Canada of over 760,000 cranks. This came after concerns were raised by the Consumer Product Safety Commission of cranks failing and leading to injury and potentially crashes. Yeah, okay. And what is that number? I mean, how many recorded cases is that of, you know, the total that are out there? So the current number of recorded failures is 4,519. And of the 2.8 million cranks sold between June 2012 and June 2019, that works out at around a 0.7% failure rate. Okay, so it's a really small number, but at the same time, four and a half thousand recorded failures is quite a lot. Exactly. And recorded failures is the key there. There could well be more that have gone unrecorded. And yeah. I think it's very safe to say that there probably are. Yeah, absolutely. So what does that actually mean for the customer and the consumers of these cranks? So here's where the waters are slightly muddied. In the United States, a no ride has been issued. So if you're in the United States, stop riding your cranks until they've been looked at by someone in a bike shop, by a mechanic. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, as far as we can tell, there has been no stop ride issued. So although the same cranks went to Europe and the United States, yeah. the goalposts, if you like, are different between the two regions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the advice within Europe is very much still to have your cranks checked out by your local Shimano dealer. Absolutely right. So from the 1st of October, Shimano will be rolling out an inspection program. Uh, this is purely cosmetic, which to me sounds slightly worrying, bearing in mind all the failures that have been happening are generally catastrophic with little or no warning. But as you said, Sam, Shimano is recommending that everybody gets their cranks checked out under this program. Yeah, and I mean, it's quite helpful because Shimano have essentially listed all of the cranks that are affected and um, we'll pop on screen now all of the codes um, for the cranks that are affected. So you can check just on the inside of your crank arm whether you have an affected crank. But I think if there's any obvious signs of any cracking, or if the chain rings are kind of coming away from the arms, if there's any weird gaps, if anything doesn't look completely flush and smooth, I think it's probably worth getting it checked out by your local dealer. And then they can kind of take a more rigorous look at the crank set to see um, if it's something that needs to be replaced. But Shimano have been quite good, haven't they? Because they've come out and said that if you have a faulty crank set, they will replace it. So that's good, right? That's exactly right. So Shimano has said that they will essentially give you a free upgrade to the most recent crank. So if you had an old Durace crank, you'll get a new Durace crank. If you have an old Ultegra crank, you'll be upgraded to a new one yeah. that is certified to be safe. They've now changed the manufacturing processes. The issue lies though that you'll only receive that upgrade if your cranks prove to fail that inspection. And once again, as that's purely aesthetic, it's... Yeah, because sometimes you can't always see when things are failing. Um, so if there's something that you haven't quite noticed yet, and that's why this kind of stop ride notice in the US versus the non stop ride notice in the Europe is kind of just slightly worrying because you could inspect your cranks today, but then in a year's time, basically you're going to have to, if you have one of these affected cranks, you're going to have to keep an eye on it to see if any problems develop later down the line. Because, you know, the cranks that did fail, it's not like they ha happened on the first ride, it happened over time. So cranks that look fine today could be, you know, broken in a year's time. So I think it's one of those things if you do really have to keep an eye on it. And that to me from Shimano is arguably almost negligent because a very complex issue is sort of being made black and white. Yeah. And I think that's where the issue lies. Yeah, so I mean, what do you think then it means for Shimano? Because I mean, I think what's really interesting here is that they are recalling products from a seven year cycle. And the other really important fact here is that not all of the Durace 9100 cranks were part of the recall. So that means that they changed their manufacturing process midway through that product cycle, meaning they knew about the problem for quite a while and what was causing it. 
Exactly, and that's where, for me, the negligence comes in. At the very least, it's a massive kick in the teeth. Yeah. I think the very fact that it's 2.8 million cranks affected over that period of time globally, which is such a huge amount, and I think that, yeah, whichever way you look at it, it's going to be very expensive for Shimano, yep. but also pretty damaging to their reputation. Absolutely. I think this has been something with, I mean, there's a very pretty popular Instagram account called Thanks Shimano, where essentially all of the failures have been logged. Um, so big shout out to those guys, but they've been on it for a really long time. And it's mad that the product cycle, obviously it was made up until 2019, the 30th of June 20 2019. We're now September 2023, four years later. Um, it is, in some ways, it has taken too long. Absolutely. So what are the implications worldwide? So this is where, once again, things get even more complicated. We actually spoke with uh, Thomas Jervis, who is a solicitor at Lee Day, a very renowned uh, company in the UK. And he sort of explained that due to the fact there's no global regulator for product recalls, basically there's different rules that can be applied all over the world. In the UK in particular, because of the way our regulatory system works, it's quite outdated. It's actually gonna be really quite tricky to legally hold Shimano to account. Obviously, you know, arguably it's not in their best interest to try and wriggle out of it yeah. because, as I mentioned before, their reputation is on the line. But just in terms of how much bureaucracy there's going to be, how much strain this will put on bike shops, distributors, bike brands, everybody is going to be affected just because of the sheer scale of Shimano. Now, other than just visually checking the cranks, you can also listen to your cranks. Now, funnily enough, Shimano posted a video two weeks ago, but it was an unlisted video on YouTube, and it's a demonstration of the noise that these cranks can make if they are defective. And it sounds a little like this. Interestingly as well is exactly what you said, that video was posted two weeks ago, which to me begs the question, how long have Shimano known about this? How long has the pressure been mounting potentially from the CPSC? Well, yeah, I mean, I reckon they've known about the problem for a really long time. Like in some ways, it's something that's been out in the wild for quite a long time. Again, thanks Shimano. Um, so I think they've probably been preparing for this for a really long time. And again, because you know, replacement units will hopefully be available from the 1st of October going onwards. They've probably had to build up an inventory of stock so that when all of these broken cranks start coming back to them, they have units they can send out to distributors so that essentially, yeah, customers can have kind of a straight swap. So they must have been planning this for a really long time. Now, Joe, you are fresh back from Italy just last week from Pinarello because they launched a new bike, the Pinarello Dogma X. So what do you actually think of the new Dogma X? Yeah, so to put things into perspective first, the Dogma X is essentially a slightly softened up Dogma F. So slightly slacker geometry, longer chain stays, higher stack, yeah. all of the main sort of candidates. And I think they did a pretty good job. I think the ethos of the bike is brilliant. Yeah. Um, the geometry is also really good. It handles really well. Yeah. The X stays technology, which they've brought in for a comfier rear end to the bike, mm -hmm did a good job of soaking up the larger bumps and the 35 millimeter tire clearance too made things really comfortable. Yeah. I did though notice a really distinct lack of stiffness from both the bottom bracket and head tube when compared to a race bike. I guess it was created not to be a race bike, but to be an endurance bike. So surely those attributes actually do make sense or not? They do make sense, absolutely. I think Pinarello really marketed this as like the performance endurance bike, if that makes sense. So for the person that wants to go fast, but also be comfortable. Yeah. And while it does the comfort pretty well, I think arguably there's just a bit of a lack of stiffness and maybe a tiny bit of the sort of true Dogma F character yeah. that could have been carried over. Oh, okay, interesting. Now, one thing that I'm wondering is the geometry that's found on the Dogma X, is that the same geometry that's found on the X series bikes? Very good question. So no, it's not. Pinarello now essentially have two different endurance bikes. The Dogma X sits a little bit closer to the Dogma F yeah. and the X series is slacker still. So right. the chain stays are the same length, but there's a higher stack yeah. and a shorter reach again. So that really is aimed more at comfort. 
Okay, so the Dogma X then makes more sense to be slightly more performance orientated than the X series themselves. That's exactly okay. right. And arguably, it's the Dogma most people should probably own. I think a yeah. lot of us get sucked into this wanting the latest and greatest race bike because Tom Pidcock rides it, because Filippo Ganna rides it. Yeah. But actually, the Dogma X, a little bit more slack, a little bit more tyre clearance, but for ma the majority of us, probably a much more usable bike. For sure. But I mean, we don't have the flexibility of professional athletes or the power output, so it makes sense that we don't actually use the same tools for the job. One thing that does interest me though is what implications does this have for the Dogma F? Now I'm predicting that a Dogma F could come either next year or 2025. So what does this then mean for that bike? Does that mean that the new Dogma F is going to be even more racy and it's going to be even more dialed in because it is essentially being made to be just for the pros? That's exactly right. So Chief of Operations at Pinarello, Maurizio Bellin, actually sort of told us over dinner quite informally, but sort of said this really lets the engineers off the hook now to do whatever they want with the Dogma F. The Dogma F really is a bike designed for the Ineos Grenadiers and it's designed to be raced at the highest level. And having the Dogma X sort of allows the engineers to go all in on a true race bike. Interesting, okay. So, I mean, it's probably fair to say that the geometry is probably gonna get a bit more aggressive, probably gonna be lighter, probably gonna be stiffer, all of the usual cues. The full complement of top trumps. Perfect. So overall then, it kind of sounds like you were kind of impressed by some features, but also let down by others in other areas. I just wonder if they could have explored other avenues to get the same level of compliance whilst keeping a higher level of stiffness in the bike. Interesting, okay. I mean, what makes this even more interesting is the fact that this bike is landing in a year where there seems to have been a million new endurance bikes. I mean, I've got a small list here. This year so far, we have had, obviously, the new Dogma X and the X-Series range of bikes from Pinarello. We've had a specialised Roubaix. We had a new Trek de Marne less than 12 months ago. We've had the new Canyon Endurace. We've had the new Specialised Dale, which was made to be more of an endurance platform. We've also had the Vitus Venon and finally, most recently, the Giant Defy. So that bike is landing in a world of brand new endurance tech. But what this also then challenges is what's even happened to the endurance category? Because it feels like the whole thing's just been obliterated and actually it just doesn't exist anymore because I feel like you've either got endurance all-road bikes or performance endurance bikes and I'm not really too sure, you know, What's actually the right thing to buy? Exactly right. And it's very telling, isn't it, that the giant Defy mm. actually shares almost the exact same geometry after getting a little bit more aggressive as the Pinarello Dogma X. They compare for a given frame size within two millimetres on stack, reach and chainstay length. And that really leads into what you were saying about there being sort of two different types of endurance bike. You've got performance oriented endurance bikes and all road endurance bikes. And I think, to be honest, that's a really good thing for the industry. Yeah. As we were saying, not all of us can ride a race bike, and I don't think we should be riding a race bike. So the fact that we now have more choice in bikes that suit the majority of consumers, for me, is a really good thing. Okay, that's really interesting, because, yeah, I guess, like, with... If you look at, say, like, the new Specialized Roubaix or the Canyon Endurace, they are really clearly tapered more to that all-road category, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and if anything, given the state of the UK roads, actually is probably pretty ideal. But I think with the Giant Defy and the Dogma Rex, I think it's going to be really interesting for us to spend more time on those bikes, because it would kind of make me wonder whether or not I'd actually want to go back towards a pure race bike, or whether or not it would actually give me all of the performance I'd actually need. Yep, I totally agree. I think it leaves the consumer with a real choice as to whether they want to go down that hardcore race avenue, which for some consumers is absolutely still going to be the right thing to do. Sure. The out and out race bikes do feel stiffer. They are often lighter. And for some people, that's exactly the right choice. But for a lot of customers, I think there's going to be an interesting choice to be made. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, given all of the new bikes that have come out um, over the past 12 months, which one would you choose? Of the cohort of endurance bikes, it has to be said, I think I'd be most interested in trying the Giant Defy. The slightly more aggressive geometry and 785 gram frame weight both really interest me. And I think as well, the way Giant has opted for gaining compliance in the seat post, yes. which is away from the frame, away from the bottom bracket, away from the head tube, could make for quite a stiff frame that's also compliant as well. Again, coupled with 38 millimeter tire clearance as well. Yeah, that's very true actually. How about you, Sam? What would you opt for? So uh, given the list that kind of I just reeled off earlier, 
I think I would actually go for the Vitus Venom because it's very much got two personalities because you can buy that bike in a full kind of road endurance build or you can buy it in a gravel build. So, and I do quite like that versatility. You know, maybe a couple of years ago, I probably would have gone for the Defy. But having got back from riding a whole bunch of gravel in Europe, actually, I'm, ah, the gravel bug is quite good. So I think having that versatility, I think, would be, would be good fun. So yeah, Vitus Venom for me. Yeah, that makes sense. So in 2022, we saw plenty of race bikes released. We did. In the last 12 months, we've seen plenty of endurance bikes released. Yeah. What's coming next? My prediction, given a couple of releases that we've had this year already, like the new Orbea and the new Factor, I think next year is very much going to be the year of the lightweight climbing bike. And I've got a few models penned that I think will be coming out. So I think a new Scott Addict is on the cards. I think a new Cervelo R5 is on the cards. I think a new TCR is on the cards. And I think all of those are going to go exactly down the same route, which is basically strip all of the weight out and go really aggressive. So yeah, next year, you heard it here first, year of the climbing bike. Bold claims. For October's Bike of the Month, you may have noticed this beautiful bike behind us, this recreation of a Rally Chopper, but very much made by Rally. Joe, tell us more about it. Exactly right. So this is a remake. It's the closest they've ever got to the original Mark II Rally Chopper that was released in 1972. Rally says that they've had to make a couple of very minor changes just to bring the bike up to date. But from an aesthetic point of view, this bike is the closest recreation of that Mark II Rally Chopper. So why do you think they actually went to the effort of making this thing? They've actually done a number of remakes over the last few years due to the fact that it's got a huge cult following. So, as I said, released in 1972, to an older generation, there's a lot of nostalgia there. Things like E.T., Goonies, yeah. but also to a younger generation as well, with the bike being featured in Stranger Things. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a real rich history there. Nice. And actually, that cult following has led to some bikes being worth quite a lot of money, right? Absolutely, yes. So on the second-hand market, a mint condition one from the sort of late 70s seems to be the, the best era yeah. for these bikes. Yeah. Bikes can fetch as much as or even more than £3,000. £3,000, that is quite a lot of money. Happily, though, this does not cost as much as that. I think this is in somewhere in the hundreds. Um, so if you wanted to get one, then I think they did a limited run of production on this bike. They did do a limited run. I did have a look on Rally's website earlier though and I think they're all sold out. Oh, brutal. Now despite all of these being sold out you will actually be able to see this bike in action pretty soon courtesy of Joe. That's exactly right. Regrettably I must say I'm not looking forward to this but I will be racing this bike in a very traditional type of British bike race. Interesting. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Do let us know down below though what you think the state of the endurance bike market is. If you enjoy the video then please do drop it a like, subscribe to the channel for more content and we will see you again very soon.